Welcome to the GSMC Business News Podcast, the show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. If you're looking for a podcast to keep you informed and ahead of the game in business, the GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Hello, thanks for joining the GSMC Business News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Paula DuPont, and today we're talking about the latest headlines in business news, specifically today where we've had some big news in the oil industry and what's happening there. We're going to then talk about the latest developments in terms of aid to small businesses and then we're going to take a deeper look at a few different industries and how they're being impacted right now. One of them, a large one, is the restaurant industry. We'll be talking about that as well as the marijuana industry, the alcohol industry, and the gaming or bet- gambling industry. Now, you might think, where? what about the guns? We haven't talked about that. Well, that might be another show. But there have been some headlines recently about some of the industries I just mentioned, and I thought it was worth uh, kind of putting them together today. So we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So I mentioned that there were some big headlines today in the oil industry, and unfortunately, depending on which way you look at it, they're not really very good, at least not for for the oil industry and all those that are connected to it upstream and downstream, Um, very downstream when it comes to the consumers. For us, it means very low gas prices. But we've been seeing that for a little while since the start of uh, our stay-at-home orders have have come out. Um, For the first time ever, West Texas, Texas Intermediate, which is a key U.S. oil benchmark, actually went below zero on April 20th as traders approached a deadline to find buyers. That means that some traders, instead of paying money to buy oil, are paying to get rid of it. So basically, if you have uh, a place where you could store some oil, they might pay you to do so. At the start of 2020, a barrel of WTI, which is West Texas Intermediate, cost around $60. Prices had dropped significantly because of the coronavirus, landing it at around $18 a barrel uh, as of last week, last Friday. Then on Monday, uh, when WTI was uh, looking to sell for their May delivery, They settled at a negative $36.63 a barrel, meaning that traders are paying $37.63 to get someone to accept a delivery of the barrel of oil. So a lot of that can change uh, depending on on other transactions that happen before tomorrow, um, but not looking great for the oil industry right now. But perhaps by the time you hear this news, things will have changed. We can we can only hope. Uh, I wanted to transition a little bit in talking to about another hot issue that uh, today there was a little bit of uh, positive news about. I've talked a lot before about the um, stimulus package and the uh, three hundred and forty billion dollars that was allocated. To help small businesses. And we found that uh, as of last week, the uh, 
accepting applications had shut down because there was no more money left. Uh, so many people had applied to it. And even in that process, while people were still applying and the money was still there, uh, there was a recognition that there was still so much more needed if we're going to keep people working and we're going to um, try to keep the economy from uh, totally tanking, at least in terms of small business. And so, uh, there, as I said, there was that recognition already and both sides of, uh, of Congress have been uh, looking at that and having different um, takes on what they what they think should be in this next deal. And uh, one thing that they do, uh, do agree upon, the Democrats and Republicans, is that it's definitely direly needed. So recently, as in over the past weekend, apparently the White House and uh, members of Congress had uh, discussed an agreement that would provide $450 billion in economic relief to replenish the depleted emergency fund for small businesses and to help expand the coronavirus testing around the country. And um, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin described the broad outlines of the package uh, as $300 billion to replenish the emergency fund, and that's the Paycheck Protection Program, $50 billion for the Small Business Administration's Disaster Relief Fund, $75 billion for hospitals, and $25 billion for testing. As I said, uh, these top-line uh, allocations come out of uh, trying to meet the demands of, of both parties and what they're looking for in terms of uh, helping out the economy. If this moves forward through Congress, as uh, some have uh, optimistically thought, and that perhaps early this week, uh, both parties will uh, look at how at moving that forward. Um, if that does happen, it represents a significant breakthrough, considering that for the past two weeks, both sides have been uh, arguing over the points that they wanted to see in the plan. Um, during that time, actually, was when the uh, the small business loans were still being given, $349 billion worth, uh, which, from what I understand, they were able to uh, give out more loans in that two-week period than they do in an overall year. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said that he was hopeful that the economy could rebound in a matter of months rather than years, and that he said that he hoped the extraordinary efforts the government had taken to encourage businesses to keep workers on their payrolls would prevent the jobless rate from reaching 20%, which, uh, as you've been following in the news, you know that we're, we're tracking close to that amount. I believe as of last week, the jobless rate was about 15%. So the next thing, I guess, the next hurdle, once they, they have truly uh, come to an agreement on the terms of this bill, uh, the next thing they have to decide is how they're going to uh, vote on it. One of the uh, methods that's been discussed is a voice vote, which would eliminate the need for them actually coming in person uh, to the Capitol. However, uh, when the uh, last bill was brought to Congress, there were those who said that uh, it needed to be an in-person vote. So they have to figure that one out yet. We're going to take a break for a commercial. And then when we come back, we're going to take a little deeper dive into the restaurant industry, how they've taken advantage of these small business loans and how they're surviving. I think we all have some anecdotal stories uh, about what we've seen in terms of that industry. So let's take a look in just a moment. Are you looking for a podcast that gives you all of the latest news from the world of finance? 
Then check out the GSMC Financial News Podcast. We'll delve into the ups and downs of the stock market, changes in the economy, and news from the world of real estate and technology. From breaking news on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the overseas market, to updates on the bond market, if there's money to be made, we'll cover it on the GSMC Financial News Podcast. Hello, we're back, and as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the restaurant industry uh, that claims itself as being one of the hardest hit by the effects of the coronavirus. On Monday, April 20th, some staggering numbers came out from the National Restaurant Association. They have said that they believe they are the hardest hit of any industry from this disaster and in fact are asking for $240 billion in federal aid from the government to uh, somehow get through this pandemic. Four in 10 restaurants have closed according to the National Restaurant Association and 8 million employees have already been laid off or furloughed. That represents two-thirds of all restaurant jobs in the United States. The trade group estimated that restaurants lost out on $30 billion in sales in March and is on track to lose $50 billion in April. So that's that's pretty devastating statistics right there. Um, restaurants in general, general are one of the largest employers in the U.S., with more than 12.2 million workers before the pandemic broke. And employment totaled more than 15.5 million, including workers at hotels, sports venues, and other sites serving food, the association had estimated. The head of the association has said that the Paycheck Protection Program which is that stimulus package that had been uh, approved, implemented, exhausted uh, as of last week, as we said. But the Paycheck Protection Program to help small businesses is too limited for most restaurants, according to the head of of that association. And he said that um, only eight weeks from the time they are granted and require businesses to spend at least 75% of the loan on salaries which, of course, was the whole purpose behind the pay, the Paycheck Protection Program. This uh, The association has said that they need loans that will last for a longer period, starting when they are allowed to reopen, and then need more flexibility on how they will use the money. Non-payroll costs are high, and restaurants that have remained open are struggling to pay them with reduced sales and smaller staffs. A survey that was done of restaurant owners, uh, 6,500 restaurant owners, showed that 60% of them said that existing federal emergency measures won't help to keep employees on their payrolls throughout the downturn. It's uh, pretty discouraging news. Um, The restaurant owners are also saying that they expect to have $240 billion in losses by the end of the year uh, because of this situation. Now, whether or not that's including in the help from the uh, payroll protection program and the new uh, bill that would provide an additional uh, several billion dollars to the industry um, or actually to small businesses in general. Uh, presumably, the restaurant industry would get to take advantage of that. Um, we're not sure if those those losses will still be the same. I know that uh, in many states, it and, and probably in terms of municipalities, it really varies as to who's able to be open. Uh, there's different rules around 
Uh, a restaurant can be open if they provide uh, takeout and delivery. Some just will have delivery. Uh, some will have curbside pickup. So it really depends on what how the uh, restaurant itself is able to adapt to that. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's a, a small subset of overall number of restaurants. But restaurants aren't just looking at aid that they can get from the federal government. There's actually another duel that's happening right now, and that's between the uh, restaurant industry and the insurance companies that insure them. The fight has to do with restaurant owners saying that through the insurance that they have, that they are covered for business interruption, quote unquote, business interruption, and that something like a pandemic should be covered by that. The insurance companies, of course, see it differently. Restaurant owners and their allies are actually lobbying the president and Congress to pressure insurance companies to cover these quote-unquote business interruption claims that stem from the coronavirus. Even where restaurants have policies that exclude losses from pandemics. Now, insurers do offer that kind of co coverage, but those policies are significantly more expensive than the standard business interruption policies, and few restaurants actually have them. Restaurants and some U.S. lawmakers say the business shutdown orders, orders in states and cities should constitute business interruptions under the existing policies. The big insurance companies argue that lawsuits from restaurants could undermine the nation's insurance system. And uh, that's what it would have to be, our lawsuits, to be able to argue that the policies would be retroactive and would cover something like a pandemic. Now, on the other side of it, you have a coalition with uh, big name business people behind it, like Wolfgang Puck, who are arguing that um, insurance companies need to pay claims even if restaurants don't have pandemic coverage, and they demand that the government should reimburse insurers. This coalition um, says that the restaurant industries are the largest U.S. employer supporting more than 15 million jobs and responsible for roughly $1 trillion in contributions to, to the U.S. economy. An attorney working with that coalition recently reviewed hundreds of business interruption policies and found that at least 20% of them cover losses from coronavirus related shutdowns because businesses were ordered to close by government officials. So both sides obviously have strong arguments and uh, it sounds like it could be a, a, quite an expensive battle to try to get to uh, a solution on that with the between the insurance companies and restaurants. In the meantime, whether or not that comes through and there's enough federal aid in this latest package to help the restaurant industry, they're going to need a lot of help. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. We see the number of people that we know who've lost their jobs or, or have been furloughed because of it. And maybe what we have to hope for is that Steve Mnuchin is correct in his uh, assertion that recovering the economy will take months, not years. Or at least that's what he hopes, and I think what we all hope. So we can be back in the restaurants, back ordering, leaving nice tips, and uh, doing our part to bring the economy back. So that takes us up to another commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to stick to the topic of restaurant industry, but zone in on a couple um, who have made some interesting choices recently. I don't mean that to sound judgmentally, but in terms of how they are staying afloat, uh, we're going to talk about that.
See you in a minute. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Hi, I'm back, and we've been talking about the loans through the Small Business Administration as part of the Payroll Protection Program, and about uh, they're just never seeming to be enough, even though there were billions of dollars made available for that, the uh, first package being $350 billion worth, and then we talked about uh, a second package that's uh, currently being reviewed in Congress, uh, that we're looking at that uh, being expedited soon. And, you know, we hear about companies that were able to take advantage of it and those who weren't uh, because the money from the first package ran out uh, after so many had applied for it successfully. We haven't really talked about who qualifies? Who is a small business? Because we also know that as part of that program, there was money carved out for the airline industry and helping them. And uh, even some other areas, the states and uh, other other uh, industries were able to take advantage of the, the payroll protection program. But in terms of the small business aspect of it and the loans that were made available, um, in general, those companies that had uh, 500 or fewer employees could qualify for the loans. And that would be loans up to $10 million that they could ask for. And the loan amount and the interest can be forgiven if companies retain or rehire most of their workforce and they use the money for those uh for expenses that are qualified um like rent and utilities that they can actually um show but you know basically the whole idea is to cover the employees well according to an article in the wall street journal ruth's chris steakhouse has been able to uh qualify for a loan through the the PPP and actually uh, and this is through the small business program they were able to get two loans for 10 million dollars each so they got 20 million dollars altogether and that's because they were able to do that for two subsidiaries Ruth's uh, Chris had said that it sought the forgivable 20 million dollar loan to ensure the company is well positioned to uh, stay viable. Now, Ruth's Chris isn't the only chain that qualified for loans. Um, Fogo de Chao also got $20 million, and J. Alexander's Holdings got uh, $15.1 million. So the issue is, whether or not these larger companies that make millions in revenue and have uh, collectively thousands of employees, if they really are the intended recipients of these loans per the vision for the uh, PPP. 
And that's what some are arguing and scrutinizing um, is the fairness of them getting these loans. Now, in the case of Fogo de Chao, which is a privately owned chain um, that does roughly $325 million a year in business, um, they had applied for the loans for its individual restaurants and two received a total of $20 million in funding. The head of the chain has said that um, about 90% of the staff has been furloughed since the beginning of the coronavirus in this country. And that uh, he said that uh, Fogo de Chao would be using the money to hire some of those people back. His big thing is that the scale of business doesn't matter. That whether you're a large chain or whether you're a a small independently operated restaurant, um, it's the same hurting basically. And uh, they need the help as well. However, there are others who, of course, argue that a publicly traded company uh, has more resources and uh, should not take up the, the money that could otherwise go to a much smaller company. Now, another company, another chain, national change, is Shake Shack. And the New York Times had reported on Monday, April 20th, that Shake Shack said that it was returning its $10 million federal stimulus loan back to uh, the Small Business Administration. Now, in contrast to that story, uh, and no judgment here, I promise, I'm just relating the information, Shake Shack, another national chain, has says that has said that it is returning its $10 million federal stimulus loan that it had received uh, in that recent package. They announced this over the weekend uh, and said that it was uh, pretty much following the criticism about the stimulus program favoring the large chains. Uh, Sounds like a little guilt trip there. It got to them. But um, basically, um, the Paycheck Protection program loans from the Small Business Administration will be forgiven for companies that do not lay off staff or that rehire them by June 30th. Shake Shack, and this is, by the way, according to the New York Times, Shake Shack with 189 outlets and nearly 8,000 employees in the United States, said it had secured the additional capital it needed through an equity transaction on Friday. Basically, they found a box of money under the bed and um, they were able to um, say, yeah, we don't really need this money after all. So the um, the chairman of Shake Shack had said that he's thankful for the effort and decided to immediately return the entire 10 million PPP loan um, so that those restaurants who need it most can get it. And now I'm really craving a chocolate shake from Shake Shack. I'm not sure. Do they deliver? Anybody know? Um, I guess they probably wouldn't deliver just a shake. All right. Oh, those were internal thoughts. Sorry. They they just seem to come out. I don't have a filter for that. Anyway, we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we are switching to what I'll call the vice report. We're going to talk about some industries that uh, we haven't talked a lot about before or at least not recently, and how they're faring during these uh, tough times. The marijuana industry, the alcohol industry, and the gambling industry. So uh, we put the sizzle at the end. So if uh, (laughs) if you're interested to see uh, how those industries are doing, uh, please join me after this commercial break. Hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. 
<laughs> From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I'm back, and thanks for joining us for the second part of the program. And as I said, we're we're going to delve into a few industries that you could put in the bucket of uh, vice, maybe? I don't know. They could be... Well, let's put it this way. Right now, different states are determining or have determined whether these businesses are, in fact, essential. And it does vary a bit. And of course, in some states, uh, things like marijuana aren't even legal yet. Um, But let's talk about what is legal and how those states are handling this business during these days of quarantining and staying in place uh, with the pandemic. So it seems a natural fit to talk about the cannabis business on 420 the day when uh, typically uh, those in the community would celebrate that uh, that famous date. Um, however, they're not doing that publicly this year uh, because of the stay-in-place quarantining rules. Um, but it has kind of drawn some focus then for the industry and how it's been doing uh, during this coronavirus. So I saw this article um, on CNBC's website uh, about the business and about uh, it being considered essential in some states. And a few key points, um, eight states have deemed recreational cannabis essential during the COVID-19 shutdowns. According to one CEO of a cannabis company said that weekly sales in March topped $134 million in California, Washington, Nevada, and Colorado, which is a 17% increase from the weekly average in 2019. In the second half of March, the average purchase already increased by 47%. With the businesses doing so well, uh, some of the top CEOs of cannabis companies are saying that uh, this is really a big opportunity for the country if marijuana would become federally legal um, it could mean uh, a real boost to the economy um, through tax revenue and job creation uh, because of this this trade according to the article the CEOs say the chances for federal marijuana legalization will dramatically increase In the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, after several states declared dispensaries essential businesses, allowing them to remain open during stay-at-home orders uh, aimed at halting the spread of the virus. Now, what this means is the fact that that the cannabis market is worth approximately $56 billion, and that's this year in 2020 with about 90% of sales going untaxed in the illegal market. So we're talking overall, uh, you know, deal around the street to uh, dispensaries making $56 billion. And so the point is that if it becomes federally legalized, uh, more of this money will be revenue that can be taxed and help out the federal government. 
the idea is that um, the CEOs are equating marijuana to alcohol when it was prohibited, saying that after the Great Depression, when the country was looking to uh, rebuild the economy, they then made alcohol uh, legal and then were able to tax it. And uh, they're looking at uh, marijuana as being something similar, as a whole untapped revenue source for the federal government. So it's an interesting um, way of looking at it. And the numbers for how well the marijuana industry is doing um, certainly are compelling, but it's still not legal in a lot of states, either recreationally or uh, for medicinal value. States such as New Jersey, Arizona, and South Dakota are expecting to have adult use legalization on their November ballots. Three other states, New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, have bills pending that could legalize adult use cannabis through the legislature. It sounds like that, um, you know, because of this whole issue of essential and non-essential businesses and the marijuana business uh, in some states being considered essential, that CEOs and others are looking at how um, they can raise the profile of this and maybe even uh, advance a little further in getting federal legalization of marijuana. And that, of course, is, is seen as sort of the holy grail for all of them. Um, especially when it means that there could be changes then in the rules around banking, which would then allow uh, those in the business to be able to use, uh, have bank accounts and be able to use credit cards for transactions and and other things, which right now uh, they're restricted from because it's not legal federally. So in terms of marijuana being considered essential in some states and, and not others, uh, is, is, you know, of course, the reason why some are feeling this is the time to really promote its profile and, and look for bigger changes at the, at the uh, policy level. Um, it's important to note that there's 11 states that have legalized recreational marijuana along with the District of, Col- of Columbia And there's 33 states that permit some form of medical use. So that's just to give a little perspective of of, uh, how widespread the business is right now. So whether or not marijuana is considered essential in each state is, in fact, determined by the state. And in Massachusetts, for example, that is one of the only states that limits uh, legal pot shops to sell uh, marijuana to medical users and not recreational users, though both are normally legal. There is another consideration in whether or not uh, marijuana should be uh, essential at this time and how much that plays a part, I'm not sure, but there has been a number of health experts who've come forward and said that smoking marijuana may not be so good for you in terms of the coronavirus, it making your lungs more weak and vulnerable um, to this basically lung-centered type of virus. So that's another factor, Um, but of course there's a lot of other products besides those that you smoke um, that perhaps is why uh, it is still considered essential in many states and, and not necessarily a health hazard. Another possible effect, or we'll call it a contact high, <laughs> sorry, um, with having marijuana business considered essential in some states is that that means that there are people working, fewer people having to apply for unemployment. Um, and considering that in the marijuana industry in the United States, As of January of this year, there were 243,000 full-time employees, and that's up 15% since last year. So that's a pretty significant workforce, and if we're able to keep any portion of them still working, uh, that perhaps is a good thing. So I will 
pause for a moment and we'll have a commercial. And when we come back, we're going to talk about alcohol. We can't not talk about alcohol after talking about marijuana. So up next after the commercial, we'll get to that story. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC. Hi, we're back, and now we're talking about alcohol and that industry, and of course, it's, you know, we don't have the legalization issues that we we do with marijuana, but the whole decision about it being considered essential in most states in this country um, has sometimes been controversial. There have been some who've wondered why that is essential, uh, considering uh, the rules that we've we've been following according to uh, social distancing and the risk of uh, those of violating those rules or perhaps coming in contact with someone if you are going to a liquor store um, or even doing a curbside pickup and what's involved in that. So we're not debating, of course, whether it should be essential or not, because that's already been decided. And I'm sure there's many who are grateful that it is considered essential. But there was an article that came out today in Business Insider that kind of gave a, another background on why states decided to make it essential. And I guess there were other factors at play that maybe some of us had an idea about and others of us didn't. And so I just wanted to share some of those, those thoughts with you. Um, liquor stores were deemed essential businesses in almost every state in the U.S., even though other stores were being forced to shut down. Stores were deemed essential in part because of how dangerous it could be for an alcohol-dependent person to undergo withdrawal, and then the potential of them uh, going to the hospital uh, at this time when uh, hospitals are focusing on, on taking care of people with COVID. Shutting down liquor stores could also convince people to travel farther to get to alcohol, to get their alcohol, and could spark backlash from angry citizens. I can tell you firsthand, living here in Pennsylvania, that uh, that is something that we saw in this area at a point when liquor stores were closed. You could still get beer and wine in uh, different grocery stores, but in terms of the liquor stores, which are state-run, uh, you could not go in there. And uh, in the beginning of this uh, sheltering in place and before Delaware was having uh, some of the same uh, outbreak that, that we saw in Pennsylvania, people were going down to Delaware right nearby, people from uh, southeastern Pennsylvania going to Delaware to get their alcohol, which uh, not only could you get it more easily, but it's also not taxed. And um, there were many in Delaware who uh, had a bit of a problem with that, not only because people were going down there and, and buying alcohol without uh, having to deal with the taxes, but also bringing the contagion with them or, you know, possibly bringing the contagion with them and basically said, you know, you guys can keep your Corona up there in Pennsylvania, please. And they weren't talking about the beer but it seems more than the risk of people traveling to other states where liquor stores would be available, um, 
the the real issue in terms of uh, keeping it essential is the fact that you have people who are um, alcohol dependent and that if suddenly access was not there for them to have the alcohol, they'd go into withdrawal and potentially have more serious health consequences that would land them in a hospital and potentially expose them to more risk as well as um, put a strain on healthcare facilities. So it's, it's a real issue, and it's something that I think could be expected if alcohol was not readily available to those who have a, a serious uh, addiction. The other consequence that you might see is that someone who uh, has a real dependency on alcohol and finds the alcohol not available, they may resort to other more desperate and unsafe uh, measures like uh, taking things that have alcohol in them but aren't beverages, um, like rubbing alcohol or even hand sanitizers. Uh, in some cases, people have even uh, drank coolant, car coolant. So these are some real extreme and desperate situations, and perhaps some would doubt whether these are real or, or real risks that we could have faced if we didn't have uh, alcohol as an essential. But the fact of the matter, it is, it is an extreme time. It is a desperate time. And if you're someone who's battling with addiction to alcohol, you struggle with it, and you layer on top of that the stress of perhaps losing your job or not being able to pay bills, not being able to see family and friends, and uh, all the things, all the anxieties that come with our current situation, it is an extreme situation. But maybe the saving grace in this is that we aren't driving, or at least not nearly what we were before. And that for uh, those of us who choose to drink at home, um, we're at least limiting those uh, who can be affected by that. Hopefully, we're all keeping it under control and we're uh, handling the anxiety in healthier ways. But nonetheless, when you're talking about uh, the government coming up with rules about what's essential, what isn't, and what we need as a society to survive, uh, you know, it's, it's dicey trying to figure that out. And it sounds like, given the article that I was citing before, that uh, a lot of states considered more than, um, you know, loss of revenue or drunk driving, and, and they weighed all those, those factors together to make decisions that uh, maintain at least some of our rights and pleasure, perhaps. So with that said, we're going to take another break, and when we come back, our last segment, we're talking gambling. So... I think we're covering just about all the vices today, and we have to talk about that one. So we'll be back in just a moment. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hi, I'm back. Well, you're allowed to have your drink. You're allowed in some places to have your pot. But uh, what are you going to do now? I mean, you can't watch any sports on TV. You can't go out to a game. There isn't anything on. 
I think the only uh, thing related to major sports that's going on is uh, the NFL draft, which is coming up soon. And that still is, it's going to be televised. It's going to be different than it's run before. Um, and you might say, what does that have to do with gambling, which is this segment? Um, but actually, <laughs> you know, when there's a will, there's a way, right? And talking about this industry, like every other, it's it's taken a hit from uh, the coronavirus and people not being able to go out to the casinos or not being able to bet on teams and no March Madness or um, even baseball. Although I don't know if people do bet on baseball or not. But in any case, um, if you're looking for something to bet on, there still are things according to some of the online um betting books so i thought i'd just highlight a couple of these things because you you might not be aware first before i highlight some of the things that you can bet on if that's your thing um is to give you a little update in terms of overall gambling and betting and in terms of like casinos and we know the casinos are shut down because of the the virus and um it's reported that New Jersey's casino and sports betting revenue fell to $163 million in March, and that's down over 44% from a year ago. Um, according to this article by the Associated Press, it was the largest monthly decline in the 42-year history of legalized gambling in Atlantic City, eclipsing the nearly 28% decline in November 2012 following Superstorm Sandy, where casinos were closed for nine days from late October through early November. With most sports shut down, sports betting revenue fell by over 58% to just over $13 million. The uh, handle or total amount wagered on sports before winning bets were paid was nearly $182 million. By contrast, internet gambling soared in March as more gamblers took to the business online. Atlantic City's casinos won nearly $65 million online, an increase of over 65% from March last year. So 65% increase uh, over a year. Indiana's casinos took in $98 million down nearly 55% from a year ago. Maryland won nearly $69 million, down nearly 58% from a year ago. And finally, Michigan's casinos won $57.4 million, down over 59% from a year ago. It's important to note that the March figures, though, uh, show significant drops in in, uh, revenues, Um, are still probably going to be better than April, which will have a full month without any sports. Um, In March, there was about a week of NBA and college basketball games in the beginning, as well as uh, some activity in the XFL Football League. Yet, as, as dismal as that was for March and April proving not to be a lot better um, and still no sports to bet on, It's not stopping a lot of people from finding other things to bet on, um, at least according to DraftKings and FanDuel, uh, among others. So some of these sites have actually gotten pretty creative in what they will take bets on. Now, they're already expecting to take bets on the NFL draft. Um, In fact, they are expecting three times as many NFL draft bets as they would uh, typically. So they've done this before. They just expect more volume on that. But what about table tennis? Do you even know where to get find a channel to watch table tennis? But apparently that's something that people bet on, as well as things like presidential debates and, uh, you know, with the candidates saying, uh, using certain words or terms, and uh, finding a creative way to place bets on that. So getting back to the NFL draft, as I said, they're expecting to get uh, even more uh, bets than usual. And um, they have the sports books, the, the different uh, sports apps, 
have about 150 different proposition bets around the NFL draft. That's three times more than they've ever had. They expect about $5 million will be wagered on the NFL draft, uh, and which is a five-fold increase over last year's amount. So they estimate that that will bring in about $500,000 for the industry. So popular apps like FanDuel and DraftKings um, are offering expect expanded bets, um, over and unders on the number of players drafted from a certain college. Um, you know, they're, they're looking for any kind of, uh, variable that they can, uh, to, uh, take bets on. But table tennis, as I mentioned, has been a big thing because, uh, apparently international table tennis matches are, uh, being televised and, uh, they're going on across the globe. So it's, uh, one of the few live events that you can actually watch and uh, legally bet on uh, through those different uh, sports books. So DraftKings has actually, uh, they had actually come up with a wager uh, during this slow time for um, taking bets on what would happen during TV shows like The Real Housewives of New York and Shark Tank. And they came up with something for the presidential debate where they enticed 70,000 bettors to a pool about what presidential candidates Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders were going to say in their March 16th debate. Apparently, they were taking bets on um, how many times somebody was going to say billionaire and, uh, you know, other, other common words that come up during the debates. I'm kind of wondering if they had a bet on who was going to uh, end up being the final candidate for the Democrats. But, um, you know, and just to clarify, too, they they have they can't just come up with betting for anything. Um, they do have to be the bets have to be approved by the gambling regulation entities that oversee that industry. I guess we can expect to see more creativity as we go forward uh, until sports comes back. Someday, someday that will come back and we have that to look forward to. So this wraps up another podcast about business news. And uh, today we've talked about all of your basic vices and how those industries are doing. And we talked about the very important restaurant industry and uh, some of the challenges it's facing right now and a little bit about the oil industry. So I hope that uh, you got something out of today's podcast and I hope you'll join us again with the GSMC Business News Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Thanks so much for joining us today. Good night. You've been listening to the GSMC Business News Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's podcast. <laughs>